preparing himself for the study of the Word of God using rebound if necessary, bringing Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Now, thank you, loving Lord, for your grace. May God the Holy Spirit glorify God the Son and help believers to advance spiritually and to be uh, forewarned from uh, this study this evening, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, uh, we have uh, noted that the Apostle Paul says, uh, but even though we are a messenger from heaven, we discounted the fact that it could not possibly be an angel. Angels did not ever announce the good news. And so we can look at the uh, literal translation of what the scripture actually says. But even though we are a messenger from heaven, and then uh, we noted that the word is not preached, but it's really euangelizo, which means to announce the message of good news, okay, from which we get the word evangelize. And so Translation, even though we are a messenger from heaven, should announce a message of good news. And then we have the, uh, and we have it in both verses, so I'll bring it out here. Uh, parho, which is really para plus H-O. Uh, the H is the rough breathing sound. And since you can't have two vowels together, you have to have, they, they put the uh, apostrophe in. But parho is an idiom in the uh, uh, Greek for contrary to. And it appears in verse 8, but it also comes up in verse 9. So he says, uh, But even though we are a messenger from heaven, should announce a message of good news, contrary to the message of good news we announce to you, let him be eternally condemned. We spent some time looking at and the principle of cherem, which is the, uh, the uh, curse from God, let him be eternally condemned. Now, as I said, that uh, verse 8 gives us a hypothetical situation. And uh, verse 9 is not a repetition of verse 8 at all. It's an advance on that. And it says uh, uh, this uh, in New International, reading the two verses together. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than the one you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Now, uh, you have to understand uh, that we have, the, well, the, fir the, the first word of verse 9 is actually the correlative adverb, which looks like this, H-O-S, hos. And uh, it means like, as, or according as. But the next word is the perfect active indicative from the Greek verb prolego, which looks like this in the Greek. P-R-O-L-E-G-O. -E now, prolego means to tell beforehand or to foretell. And uh, the perfect tense indicates something which was completed in the past with current results. So we know that what Paul says, as we have already said, is not referring to back to verse 8. In other words, he's not repeating what he said in verse 8, but he's referring to something that took place in the past when he was there with them. And uh, he uses the plural pronoun to indicate that the message that was given originally was shared by the other members of his team, and that was a, a, a message of warning that there were going to come uh, times uh, when there would be uh, the false teaching uh, coming along. Uh, so, uh, that, uh, together with the uh, words, and now, uh, or so now, uh, we recognize that Paul uh, is... Uh, uh, is updating uh, what had been done in the past. Uh, so, uh, undoubtedly, Paul is referring to past warnings 
that he has given to them, that had been given to him, that he is now referring to as something which is currently taking place. Uh, and uh, as Dr. Weiss says, uh, this fact marks this statement not simply as a past fact, but one of which the results remain, doubtless, in that which they remember or may be assumed to remember the warnings which Paul had given to them. This makes the defection of the Galatians all the more inexcusable. And so what was warned by the whole group, uh, the second pronoun Paul uses is in the singular. He repeats, I say again, or I repeat uh, again. I make it clear a second uh, time. Uh, R.T. Pauline which is A-R-T-I P-A-L-I-N and Paul says I say it again or I repeat uh, again. Uh, uh, in other words Paul uh, gave them this warning that he had re that he had given to the Ephesian elders. Remember, after I've gone, and then uh, he warned them of the grievous wolves which would come in. Uh, as uh, I read in the uh, autobiography of uh, uh, former President Ronald Reagan, uh, the strong stand that he took. I think back of the uh, previous years uh, when the communist threat uh, to our great nation was uh, very, very prevalent. Uh, there were uh, times, remember, when Khrushchev said, uh, uh, we'll bury you? And uh, 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 it wasn't from lack of effort that that didn't happen. It wasn't because the Soviets and their uh, uh, stoolies around the country, around the world, I should say, uh, uh, were, uh, uh, didn't have resolve or didn't have ability. It's just that uh, we, were, we were strong. In fact, I believe the election of Ronald Reagan turned the whole thing around, and unless he were elected at that point in time, there's a good reason to believe that uh, the nation would have... Uh, would have been ready for takeover very, very readily because there are always those people uh, who uh, poo-poo the buildup of the military and uh, they uh, always say that it is much better. Uh, let's, uh, let's throw our money at the social needs and not be militarily strong. Well, uh, most of the time the warnings went unheeded and our military degenerated. Our, the funds were at an all-time low, men had to, uh, they, the funds were so low that they had uh, not enough money but to shoot maybe two or three rounds okay, in, a, in an exercises that they took. Okay, and uh, even now, even as we speak, with the uh, pulling down of the Berlin Wall and the breakup of the uh, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, uh, the, it appears as if communism is on the decline throughout the world. And uh, so the cry again passes through the United States of America, let's reduce our military, let's get rid of, uh, of all of this expense, let's deal with social programs. And yet there still are those uh, who would warn us uh, against the folly of uh, being disarmed in, a, in a, uh, a world where there is such a thing as an old sin nature and where some uh, is uh, potential uh, uh, idiotic strong man like Saddam Hussein could rise up at any moment and uh, become a threat to the United States of America. Uh, we, uh, we need to continuously heed those warnings. Those are important warnings. Uh, we uh, receive warnings of all kinds of things. Uh, warnings of the coming economic uh, explosion we have talked about uh, if, with the regard to Larry Burkett's book. All of these things, warnings, and, and uh, yet the real warning that needs to, be, to go out is the warning about false teachers. Every pastor, 
is responsible to consistently warn his congregation the, about the dangers of false teachers and false teaching. Our Lord Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 and 16, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you shall know them. And so the translation, as we have said on a previous occasion, I say now again. And then he goes on to warn them. Uh, again, he uses, this time, however, he uses the protasis of a uh, first-class condition in the Greek, the, the particle A, E-I, plus a verb in the indicative mood, which is going to give us a fulfilled condition. So he is saying this, okay, if and it's true, uh, the, we have again the present middle indicative of euangelizo, which is the same as it was in verse 8, to announce the message of good news, but this is a perfective present. A perfective present tense it goes back to the time where uh, it was taught in the past, uh, this false doctrine, and it is continuing to be taught in the present. So it's called a perfective present. And again, we have para ho, uh, which is contrary to. So, uh, uh, and then there's an advance, remember. Uh, in verse 8, uh, he talks about the gospel which was uh, given to you or, or uh, announced to you, you see, uh, that we, we announced. But in this verse, it says what? That this is the one that you have received if it's different than the gospel you have received. But received, it looks like this. L-A-M-B-A-N-O, which is correct, except that this is a compound of lambano, preceded by para, para lambano, and P-A-R-A, uh, para lambano, okay, it means to, uh, more than to receive, it means to take to oneself, to receive to oneself. It is used of a hospitable welcome that a host gives to a guest. It was the kind of welcome the Galatians gave the gospel of the grace of God when it was first proclaimed among them by Paul and his associates. So the translation of uh, verse uh, 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 9 says, As we have said on a previous occasion, I say now again, if anyone has announced good news to you in the past with the result that they are announcing it to you now, and they are currently doing this, first class condition, which message is contrary to the one you received, let him be eternally condemned. You know, folks, uh, the world is filled with false doctrine. And there are dilettantes, people who are always looking for something new and esoteric. I was just looking through some things just for for fun uh, and uh, I thought I'd bring a couple to your attention here is a, an interesting uh, sheet now let me just read some of the things it says on here we the anointed are a group of happily contented young people who have found God after having had many various experiences some of us have had delinquent problems because we have had delinquent parents that have come from delinquent homes some of us have come from discontented universities and educational institutions whose teaching staff and systems reflect the discontent within them. Some of us have come from communities and places where we have lived in neglected poverty because of the selfishness of those in responsible positions who refuse to unselfishly see our needs. Some of us have been on drugs and many forms of outside stimulants in order to attain some form of inward reality because we could not find the genuineness of reality that we look for and hope to find either from our parents, our educators, or our community leaders. When we approached any of these people, we felt the influence of their phoniness, or we felt the influence of their complete disregard for our concern, our feelings, and our desire to be useful citizens. It sounds terrific so far, doesn't it? Well, I want you to know that it doesn't come out and say at the very beginning what they're about. And this is, desi this is designed to capture people and to get the unsuspecting. We have come from every walk of life. 
We make up a many-sided group of religious backgrounds. Some of us, some of us have been Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, transcendentalists, agnostics, and atheists. But all of us, in one way or another, were in no sense of the term phony. Little did we dream we were looking for the one true God by searching for reality and truth. Boy, you see, this sounds great. Let me, I can't read the whole thing. Let me skip it here. We have taken the name, the anointed, because we have found the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He was once called Jesus of Nazareth. He has filled us with His Holy Spirit. He has healed us from incurable diseases, from continual drug addiction, without withdrawals or fears of relapse, from uncertainty and unreality, and revealed His truth to us. He has taken our sadness and depression. He has given us joy and freedom of spirit. He has removed the hate and the, the discontent of our hearts and has given us His love and peace. He's forgiven us our mistakes, our failures, our shortcomings and sins, and have replaced them with His infinite love and kindness. Hmm. He has come again to earth in the 20th century. We know him as Brother Julius of Dover, New Jersey. You see, I mean, I'm talking about this kind of stuff will, will capture the, the, the simple, the simple-minded. Uh, this is uh, put out by a fundamental church. In fact, the pastor at one time was... Uh, uh, when I was one of the officers of the Moody Alumni Association, he was the, uh, the other officer. He was president, I was vice president. And it's so five signs to a new life. That looks good. What are they? Well, let's see. First of all, stop. Recognize that if you're proceeding under your own power, you're going in the wrong direction. Away from God's help. Well, that's, uh, that's good. Yeah. Two, yield to God's Son. He alone is able to provide forgiveness for your sins. Three, follow the one way that Jesus has mapped out in the Bible. Boy, it's getting better. Four, make a full turn. Oh, you, you can't do that. The depraved person can't make a full turn. Are you turn? That's, that's wrong. And of course... Then you have the last one is a guaranteed reservation in heaven. <laughs> this is a, a little leaflet that was put out. Uh, the assurance of the believer. Well, that sounds great. The scripture teaches that the Christian believer may have the blessed assurance of being saved. He need not be in uncertainty as to his relationship with God. He can know beyond doubt that his sins are forgiven and he is a child of God. Gee, that sounds like what we believe, isn't it? Um, but, let me just skip over a few things. Nowhere in the New Testament is it suggested that a Christian can presume on his saved relationship. Nowhere is the idea conveyed that he has arrived and all that he needs to do is coast in because of some kind of an initial act of faith. Nowhere is encouragement given to the backslider that since he was once saved, he will always be saved. Nowhere is there any support for the antinomian heresy that a Christian can indulge in sin with impunity. Uh, you, you have to remember there, watch and pray, beware, uh, give diligence uh, in all kinds, of, maintain good works, hold fast your profession. Uh, quotes all kinds of these things. A whole thing, see. Let's put truth in balance and so forth. And you know, it's put out by the missionary church. <laughs> right from this town. Well, since I picked on the missionary church, let me pick on uh, my alma mater. Uh, having heard Dr. Sweeting uh, give a message on uh, uh, faith and works, Dr. Sweeting said that repentance was necessary for salvation. And he, and he made the statement that repentance is a genuine sorrow toward God because of sin, an inward repugnance to sin necessarily followed by actually forsaking it, and a humble self-surrender to the will and service of God, which is not what repentance is at all, biblically. And then he went on to suggest that this, he said, uh, uh, 
I do not believe that Dr. Sweeting was negligent in his description of true repentance. I'm sure that much of Dr. Sweeting's thinking concerning repentance is a direct result of too much of the easy believism we see around us today. Too many people are suggesting salvation is possible by simply believing. Well, it is. It is. Department of Broadcasting. Well, they got another letter from me, but that doesn't make a bit of difference. You see. The, the, the largest, uh, the most uh, widely spread uh, uh, television program today is the uh, uh, Hour of Power put on by Robert Schuller, the, the most widespread Christian program. And uh, 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 Moody Monthly uh, uh, had, came out with a uh, very interesting uh, review of his book on self-esteem and uh, he, uh, I, I'm not going to read the whole article, but it's a couple of things. Um, he tries in his book, uh, in an effort to be biblical, he attempts to link the chapters uh, in, the, uh, in his book with the principles given in the Lord's Prayer. But he demonstrates no real connection and no sound biblical hermeneutic to support it. In a personal conversation I had with Schuler. About this review, he wanted me to say that he, he could sign the Reformed Statement, including the doctrine of salvation through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who died and rose again. But it is difficult to understand such a claim because he gives only token service to that position, while repeatedly denying it by affirming several mystical, psychological views of salvation. He presents another gospel. The great error of the book centers clearly around this matter of the doctrine of salvation. Schuller is calling for a new reformation that brings people to God and to Christ through self-esteem and then uh, to self-esteem. He preaches a salvation, but not the one familiar to readers of the Bible. Schuller asked me to say that while he does not believe in a verbally inspired or inerrant scripture, he does affirm it as a rule of and basis for conduct. He also asked that in the review, I not make final judgments, but ask questions. I'm willing to do that. And uh, Schuler's affirmation of some scriptural authority makes the following questions fair. How can we believe Schuler when he says, quote, pride in being a human being is the greatest single need facing the human race today? Schuler has said what we need is a theology of salvation that begins and ends with a recognition of every person's hunger for glory. Especially when God says, I will not give my glory to another. How can we believe that the truth about man can only be known in cooperation between Scripture and psychology, as Schuler claims? Are we to believe Schuler's claim that all the saints of the past had a basic flaw in their theology because they didn't believe in psychology? Schuler says, what would Jesus say if he could speak to us today? Would he tell us what miserable th sinners we are? I think not. <laughs> Can you believe that? I don't know, uh, you know. Is this the message Jesus gives us in the gospel, is his question. Uh, I, I think that, you see, these, are, these things are uh, consistently going around. I have here an article by... Uh, Dr. Daniel Fuller from Fuller Theological Seminary about the fact that the Bible is filled with errors which uh, are non-revelational, uh, which means that it is filled with errors regarding history and science and uh, all the rest. So, I mean, the, the, I'm not dealing with uh, something like this. Here's an article. A, a cult fears nuclear Armageddon. At least 2,000 followers of a religious group have streamed into majestic Paradise Valley from around the world, preparing to spend years in underground shelters safe from a nuclear Armageddon they believe is imminent. I mean, you aren't going to fall for that kind of stuff, I hope, I would think. But some of this other stuff is common. It's, it's very common. It's running around. It's running rampant all over the world. And particularly here, and there's always some uh, new uh, uh, guru, new uh, uh, new uh, view of things, uh, someone who has rethought something or other, and it's uh, uh, now being propagated. And so the, the apostle uh, Paul 
uh, warns these people. Uh, let me read the uh, translation to this point and then take up the last verse in the uh, uh, in this in uh, Galatians 1 uh, uh, chapter 1 verse uh, 10 which is the 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 end of the first book the our first commentary on Galatians uh, is Galatians 1 1 through 10 and uh, it contains uh, 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 quite a bit uh, of information several doctrines an appendix on the doctrine of the church uh, and uh, many other doctrines that uh, and uh, uh, I can't I guess I can't ask uh, Scott to, hey I've already got him doing so much I may just uh, go ahead and print this uh, uh, as it is uh, I've tried to correct the errors uh, as far as uh, uh, typos and so forth in it but uh, uh, it won't be the way I like it because I like I, it's going to be in an eight and a half by five and a half and when we reduce this material to the eight and a half by five and a half format it's going to be a small print but it's better to have it out than to have it tied up somewhere so here's the translation so far puts it all together and then brings it up to verse 10 which is a very important verse Paul an apostle not from the ultimate source of men neither through man but from the source of and through the agency of Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead with the support of all the brothers with me to the churches in Galatia. Verse 3, Grace and peace to you from the ultimate source of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the one having once and for all graciously given himself on behalf of and for the benefit of our sins, and by which means he may rescue us for himself from the immediate source of this currently operating perniciously evil age according to the will of God our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Verse 6, I am absolutely amazed that you so readily, so rashly, are defecting from the one who called you by the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not a gospel at all, since, as the case may be, there are some, the troublemakers, unsettling you, desiring to pervert the gospel of Christ. But, verse 8, even though we are a messenger from heaven, should announce a message of good news contrary to the message of good news we announce to you let him be eternally condemned as we have said on previous occasion I say now again if anyone has announced good news to you in the past with the result that they are announcing it to you now and they are currently doing it which message is contrary to the one you received let him be eternally condemned now I'm going to give you the expanded, corrected doctrinal translation of verse 10 and then go back and take it apart for you from the text of Jesus. Having noted what I have just said, all right, now am I seeking to gain the approval of men rather than the approval of God? Or am I seeking to curry favor with men? If I were at this late date pleasing men, and I'm not, I were not subservient to Christ. Now, what happens in verse 10 is this. The Apostle Paul now answers by rhetorical question uh, statements which are made by his critics. Paul's antagonists have alleged that Paul has toned down the requirements of the law in order to make his gospel message more popular to gain approval uh, from the Galatian churches. They said that his ambition is to build churches and to gain a uh, great following. And in order to, to, to do this, he has watered down the gospel by taking the elements of the law out of it and putting in, making it so uh, easy. Uh, does that remind you of easy believism from a letter that I just wrote? Sure. They, these Judaizers, uh, say, look, we have come for the purpose of restoring the gospel to its true content. And they asserted that Paul's gospel of liberty was a, a piece of conscienceless accommodation to the Gentiles' reluctance 
to accept the law. Uh, oh, the, we, we preach Christ, yes, but we preach it in its proper setting, and that is the, uh, the setting of the law without which the Galatians could not be saved. So, Paul begins with the adverb of time, R-T. We already noted it, A-R-T-I, which means now at this present juncture, plus the causal conjunction used idiomati idiomatically, so that Paul is really saying, well now, now am I pleasing men? Uh, in other words, listen to what I've just finished saying. Does that sound like I'm trying to please people? Does that sound like I care uh, what men think? Or something like this. Okay, you've said that I preached only to please men. After what I've just said, am I doing that now? Am I pleasing men? Paul never cared about what the audience thought about his message. Now, he was gracious. And there were a couple of times that the Apostle Paul was so gracious that he accommodated himself to uh, certain circumstances and uh, situations. But in so doing, the Apostle Paul uh, was just being gracious. He was not uh, seeking to please men. When he did uh, uh, accommodate himself, uh, it was always for a purpose. For example, there was a time when he uh, had Timothy circumcised. Now, there was no need for Timothy to be circumcised as far as the uh, doctrine is concerned but so that Timothy would not become a bone of contention and be a hindrance to his message, since he had a Jewish mother and a Gentile father, uh, Timothy was circumcised, and Paul did it, for the purpose of keeping away the, the antagonism. Uh, just the same as it was in the Acts 15 conference. Paul went along with, the, uh, the uh, agreement, and we'll look at the Acts 15 Pastors Conference after a bit in our, in our second volume. But uh, they came along and they said, uh, yeah, tell the Gentiles they are saved by grace through faith, only we ask them uh, to abstain from meat offered to idols. And you'll notice that nothing ever came of the things that they asked the Gentiles to do. Never again was it ever heard of. It was written in the first letters, and after that it was just dropped. Well, Paul said, go ahead, say what you want. I'm not going to preach it. I'm not going to teach anything like that. It has no, no part of the gospel. It doesn't belong there. It has nothing to do with it. But I'll go along with it for the sake of the harmony of the group and not make a big deal of it. So he was willing to be gracious and kind and not to uh, demand that everything be uh, crossed, the T crossed right and the I dotted. But not when it came to the gospel. No way. Not at all. The Apostle Paul would not give one inch when it came to the message of the gospel and the perversion of that message. Uh, he would not uh, uh, try to impress people or gain the favor of the audience uh, in any way. Uh, Wiest points out, it is as if someone was reproved for undue severity, and he answered, the severity of my language at least proves that I am no flatterer. And he was not. The present active indicative of the word pytho is an interesting word. P-E-I-T-H-O. Uh, pytho means to persuade. It means to seek to persuade. It means to uh, endeavor to convince. But when he uses it in the context here, First of all, it's the present active indicative. Secondly, it refers to uh, persuading men or God. So we know one thing. He, it, he's not using it in the sense of persuading or convincing someone. So we have to look beyond that particular meaning to find out what is meant. 
in uh, the Dictionary of the New Testament Theology, edited by Colin Brown, he tells us that the present indicative, it not only denotes the duration of the action, but the fact that it is taking place at the present, and that the context must determine the meaning of the word. In this passage, it is one of the two places where the active voice is used, and it does not refer to persuasion to accept the gospel. It rather means to gain the favor of. And so the theological dictionary of the New Testament comes to our aid as we read that Paul is saying this. At this point, uh, well now, uh, or... Uh, 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 having noted what I have just said, okay, all right, now am I seeking to gain the approval of men rather than the approval of God? Edie says that it means to conciliate by persuasion or to make friends. Lenski says it means trying to secure the approval of someone. With this question, Paul makes it clear that he's not trying to win them to his way of thinking by his language. It was no human passion, no personal animosity, no jealous emotion uh, that he was uh, feeling. It was his duty to tell them the truth, to proclaim the gospel. He couldn't do anything else. Dr. Weiss points out that a similar charge was made of Paul by his opponents at Corinth, who said that he, when he was with them, he was abject, he was servile, he was uh, uh, innocuous, but when he left them, he was daring, presumptuous, bold, uh, and uh, uh, that is not true. We, we realize that Paul had a different purpose in mind when he was there and then when he had to write later to correct them. Then we have the disjunctive particle, which is simply looks like this in the Greek, <laughs> and it's, it's the Greek eta, and it's used as a disjunctive particle, and it means rather than. Correctly translated, as seeking to gain the approval of man rather than the approval of God. The insinuation was that, that Paul was more interested in getting men to be pleased with him than God, you see. And so that's why he dropped the elements of the law from his message. But uh, uh, that is not, we, we understand that, is, we know that's not the case because we know he's teaching the true gospel because the true gospel has nothing to do with human works. Then he adds the second uh, reference to men. Am I seeking to gain the approval of men or am I trying to please men? Uh, trying uh, is... Uh, the uh, present active indicative of, of zeteo, z, or pardon me, looks like this. That's the Greek. I was mixing the two. Z-E-T-E-O, zeteo. Zeteo means to seek, to pursue, to endeavor, to obtain. This is a customary present tense for that which is habitually occurring or that which is alleged to be occurring. The Apostle Paul, uh, uh, using this word, instead of am I trying, it should be okay, am I seeking. Present tense indicates that the active voice, the subject, Paul produces the action of the verb. But to please is the present active infinitive. Infinitive always denotes what? Result or purpose. Remember that. And the word here is aresco. A R E S K O. Aresco. And aresco means to be pleased, acceptable, to curry favor. And the infinitive of purpose. Uh, it, it, this would indicate that the purpose. Uh, translation, or am I seeking, is, is my purpose to be seeking to curry favor with men? Well, we know that that's not true. When Paul came to the end of his life, in 2 Timothy 4, 3, he says, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. 
they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths or fables. And Paul would never be guilty of this. And it's true that congregations demand of their pastors from time to time to say things that they want to hear. And uh, should the minister ever tell the truth, there's a good chance he'll get his walking papers very, very soon. Well, Paul would never be accused of that. Many times when you first come to a congregation before the honeymoon is over, you know, they tell you, oh, pastor, we want you to preach the word. But uh, after you've stepped on toes a few, many, a few times, and the, those uh, steps begin to hurt, uh, people don't like uh, to be corrected too often. Uh, they begin to say, why do we have such a negative message all the time? Let's have a positive message. And so they can look for someone who will be more, quote unquote, positive. Uh, in fact, uh, the whole passage is so harsh that some translators have actually added some words in the original Greek texts. As Lightfoot points out, uh, he says, one of many attempts of transcribers to smooth down the ruggedness of St. Paul's style. Can you imagine having the audacity to add to the original Greek when you're transcribing it because it's too harsh? But that's exactly what it is. It hurts too much. It's too personal. Listen, if Paul had wanted to please men, what would he have done? He'd have stayed a Pharisee. That would have been the popular thing to do, to stay a Pharisee, can't to promote the law, rather becoming a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is what he says he has done. So he says, uh, having noted what I have just said, all right, now am I seeking to gain the approval of men rather than the approval of God? Or am I seeking as a purpose to be currying favor with men? Then he goes on with the what New International says, if I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Now we have if, and we have the particle A plus in the in the apotesis of the first class third, of the second class condition we have the negative on. So this introduces us to a second class condition, or what is called a contrary to fact condition, or if and it's not true. So when he says if. I were still trying to please men, he is saying, if, and it's not true. So, if I were seeking to please men, and I am not. He made it very, very clear. He's not seeking to please men. With it, we have the adverb eti, uh, E-T-I, meaning uh, still, yet, further, any longer, plus the imperfect, active indicative of oresco. Oresco, again, to please. The imperfect tense, uh, translated, uh, related to the principle of uh, continuous action in past time, translated best with the uh, English were. Uh, and so uh, uh, we have and this, the, the, the word that counts here is doulos, D-O-U-L-O-S, uh, or uh, the form that is, that is used here in the, uh, in the passage, uh, meaning uh, enslaved, enthralled, or subservient. Translation, if I were at this late date pleasing men, and I am not, I were not subservient to Christ. In other words, Paul makes a declarative statement which says that I could not be the king of servant of the king of kings and the lord of lords and still please, seek to please men. But uh, Paul would rather alienate all of the Galatians than to reduce or change one single point in the glorious gospel of grace to please them or anybody else. And I think somewhere along the line, each believer ends up with his decision that is he going to uh, attempt to gain popularity with men or is he going to be acceptable to God? 2 Corinthians 5, 9, Paul told the believers in Corinth, so we make it our goal to please him. 
It's God's approval that counts. As Edie says, to his servant, his will is one law. His work is one service. His example is one pattern. His approval, the continuous aim, and his final acceptance, the one great hope. It's what counts with God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 2 to 4, Paul says, Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear. But that doesn't make me innocent, for it is the Lord who judges me. And if a man like Paul is incompetent to judge the quality of his service, how can the rest of us? If the message preached by our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, was not acceptable to the world system, and because of his message they crucified the Lord of glory, how dare we expect that the world system is going to accept our message when it wouldn't accept his. For after all, the servant is not greater than his master. So Paul concludes this chapter, or this section, this introduction, having noted what I have just said, all right, now am I seeking to gain the approval of men rather than the approval of God? Or am I seeking to be currying favor with men? If I were at this late date pleasing men, and I'm not, I were not subservient to Christ. And with that, he closes the first segment, the introduction, really, in this wonderful book of Galatians. And with that, we have available the first book of our commentary series on Galatians. And it is available for the asking uh, for those who are listening in the audience. And we are now ready to begin looking at Volume 2. And so we invite you to write for the second volume in our series on the book of Galatians, the commentary on Galatians, beginning with chapter 1, verse 11, through chapter 2, verse 21. We are going now to take up the first major division of uh, the book of Galatians. The, 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 the first major division. Up to this point, it has been all introduction. Now we're going to uh, look at several things in the, in the next portion, uh, which uh, will be uh, contained under volume two. Uh, and that is the origin of Paul's gospel. Where does it come from? And it's going to take him six points to prove it. He's going to begin by pointing out that he has received a special revelation from God. Not that we should accept, expect, pardon me, a special revelation directly from God. But in verses 11 and 12, he's going to point out that he did receive a special revelation from God. He's going to point out, secondly, that his previous education could certainly not have been the source of the gospel because by the way he was previously educated is just the opposite of the truth of the gospel. And we'll see that in chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Thirdly, they had said, well, you got the message from the apostles. Uh, and he says, uh, uh, well, I'm going to tell you something. I could not have received it from uh, the uh, apostles, and here's why. And he makes it very clear in verses 15 through 17. And then singling out two of the apostles, he shows that he did not receive it from Peter and James. In uh, chapter 1, verses 18 to 24. And in, he, in this 
passage of chapter 1, verses 18 to 24, Paul reveals something. Uh, you see, remember after his first missionary journey was, was completed, they had a pastor's conference in Jerusalem. And at this pastor's conference, they called on the pastors to come and give a word of testimony. And Peter testified uh, about the sheet that came down from heaven. And then Barnabas was called on and Paul was called on to speak. And in, in Acts chapter 15, you have the official minutes of that meeting. But, but Paul says, forget about the official minutes of that meeting. And in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in Galatians 1, 18 to 24... Paul tells what went on behind the scenes. What did, what actually took place behind the scenes? And I'm going to let you in, Paul says, on what really took place. Uh, Paul uh, came to the pastor's conference ready to precipitate a very uh, heated argument. He could have brought with him young Timothy, who was circumcised. No issue. But he didn't. He chose to bring with him an uncircumcised Titus to make an issue out of Titus. That's just like Paul. Do I seek to please men? Yeah, I'll tell you I seek to please men. That's why I took Titus to the pastor's conference. Almost sounds like R.B. theme. <laughs> I can almost hear him, you know. When he was called on to speak at the Dallas Seminary Senior Banquet, he spoke on the dog shall return to his vomit. I don't know why you'd choose that. But anyway. No, he says, no, I didn't receive it from Peter and James. As a matter of fact, I precipitated everything I could to make sure that the issue was clear. And then he goes on to say... Uh, uh, I don't know, what was I using, letters or numbers? Yeah, letters. Okay, he, he says, uh, actually, I maintained my independence from all the apostles, the other apostles. And he clar clarifies that in chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. And then he says, to, to show you that I have not had any collusion with the other apostles, here's the coup de grace. He says, I took Peter to task publicly before the church at Antioch because of the fact that Peter refused to allow the freedom of the gospel to permeate there. And so I took him and I based him in front of the whole congregation. And you know what? Peter took it. Because he was wrong and he knew it. Ha <laughs> ha. Chapter 2, verses 11 to 21. So this is where we are going as we begin our new section, our new uh, uh, increment, uh, Galatians, increment number 2, volume 2, verses 1, uh, ver chapter 1, verse 11 through chapter 2, verse 21. And again, we invite you, if you have not already got it, ask for the first volume, or now you can write for the two volumes. Write for volume one and volume two. They will both be available to you by the time you hear this on radio or see it on television. Both volumes will be available uh, to you. Let us pray. Now, thank you, Heavenly Father, for the uh, precious book which we are studying and for the uh, truth which is brought out in it. Uh, thank you that the Apostle Paul refused to be intimidated by men, uh, be pushed, pressured by men, whether they uh, be in the church or out of the church, whether they be the legalizers or, or the, uh, uh, the uh, Judaizers, or whether they be uh, apostles. Uh, he refused in any way to compromise the great message of salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. And for this we are eternally grateful because this has come down to us today in the book of Galatians as the magnificent example of the Magna Carta 
of the church of Jesus Christ, that we are saved by grace through faith alone, plus nothing. Thank you for this glorious message that we have received ourselves and we can share with others. In Jesus' name, amen. For the study of the word of God, there's a privilege of uh, praying.